What I would like to do is to try and give an historical perspective uh, for the way I understand the situation today, and especially focus on the significance of this coming week or two weeks in the history uh, of the conflict between uh, Israel and the Palestinians. My own feelings, and maybe some of you have read one or two pieces I have written on this, my own feeling is that whatever happens in the United Nations is the final accord in the history of the external and an internal attempt to partition Palestine into an Arab and Jewish state. I think that this will be the final and futile attempt to impose or to induce the two sides to settle for the partitioning of Palestine as the best solution for a conflict that already rages on for more than a century. And the reason I say this has to do with my own historical research. I am a historian by profession. I am also an activist, but I fuse the two together. together. The historical research feeds my political analysis, and whenever I'm stuck with my political analysis, I go back to history. And I think that what I would like to do more than anything else is to go back to the origins of the present peace process, which I think is coming to an end in the next year or so. The moment of birth for the present peace process, the one which involves strongly the Americans as the main peace mediators, uh, and involved also other Western countries and some Arab states and a certain pragmatic Palestinian leadership. Uh, this particular process started in around 1970. Up to 1970, or let's say between 1948 and 1970, there was no serious attempt by Western powers or the United Nations to push forward a solution between Israel and the Palestinians or Israel and the Arab states, uh, for various reasons to which I will not go in. But what is important is that peace as an objective of the international community and of the regional actors appears on the map after the June 67 war and is very much dominated by two actors, one local, which is Israel, and the other international, which is the United States. I'm not saying that there were no, no other actors involved in articulating the guidelines for the peace process, or there were no other uh, states or agencies that uh, were involved in the act of mediation. But basically, the show was run by Americans and Israelis, as, is, as it still is until uh, today. The peace process had three basic guidelines, which I think are falling in front of our eyes into an abyss, and I don't think they will ever make it the way back. The first principle was that anything that happened before 1967 is not relevant for a solution between the Israelis and the Palestinians. That, uh, in particular, the events of 1948, the way Israel was created, the way Israel was founded, is not negotiable, is not part of an attempt to bring reconciliation and peace to the torn Holy Land. So one, one fundamental guideline was the conflict, in a way, starts when Israel occupies the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And from this stems the second guideline. The second guideline is that Palestine 
as people knew it in 1970 really means only the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which, as you know, is 22% of historical Palestine. So the peace process began with the assumption that you can shrink the territory of Palestine and condense it into the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which is something I think most Palestinians still, until today, do not accept. Neither do I, but my own personal opinion is not important here. The third guideline, again, which stems from the first guideline, is that the Palestinians, as people, are basically those who live in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which is less than half of the Palestinian people. So peace, as it was envisaged in 1967, was a process that wanted to bring a resolution or a dialogue between Israel and only part of the Palestinian people, and which focused territorially and geographically on a small part of Palestine. Now, until the outbreak of the First Intifada in 1987, there was no Palestinian partner uh, for such a formula. As you know, the Israelis, in fact, were much more interested in Jordan as a prospective ally in implementing that kind of a peace solution. In, after the uh, first uh, intifada, there was a noble, I think, the only noble American attempt to try and talk about a comprehensive settlement, uh, which was in a way outflanked by the Oslo uh, Accord in 1993. So we don't know what would have emerged from the Madrid conference in 1991 that was convened immediately after the first Gulf War, and which I think was much more serious in the sense that it included uh, uh, more Arab countries in the negotiations, and there was at least an, a basic understanding that the issues of Palestine concern not only the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and not only the Palestinians who live there. But in any way, this was a, a chapter of history that was not, did not materialize and uh, did not become a significant landmark in the history of the conflict. Whereas the Oslo Accord of 1993 did become an important landmark. And, and in that accord, for whatever reason, Palestinian leader, in fact, the Palestinian leadership, accepted the formula that was stipulated by the Americans and the Israelis back in 1967. Why did they do it? Was it right? Was it wrong? It's something we can discuss later. The fact is that they accepted the formula. Uh, they claim, especially if you read uh, uh, some of the memoirs of Palestinian politicians who participated in the early uh, uh, attempts to conclude the Oslo Accord, they actually believe that accepting the formula of no history, if you want, to the conflict, only the West Bank and the Gaza Strip as the future territory, and only the Palestinians who live there as the future people of Palestine, that they accepted it uh, as only a temporary step towards a more general discussion of what they call the final settlement. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. These are politicians. It doesn't matter whether they are Palestinians or Jews. It's very hard to believe that they say the truth uh, in their memoirs. Uh, and, and that's not important. The important thing is that they accepted it. Now, interestingly, while they were talking with the Israelis in Oslo about the implementation of these three guidelines, the reality on the ground began to distance itself, if one can use this phrase, began to distance itself from what was talked about in Oslo or around the negotiation table. And this is a phenomenon that I think is going to come to a, a peak, in a way, with the United Nations, the prospective United Nations resolution. 
while the Israelis and the Palestinians negotiated what kind of Palestinian presence would be there on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, the Israeli government began a series of unilateral policies and action that were very typical to the Jewish state to make sure that certain facts are being established on the ground so that when and if there is a final kind of settlement for the Arab-Israeli conflict, there are already some irreversible facts that cannot be negotiated. And it's not surprising. If you convince the Palestinians, or at least certain Palestinians, that uh, everything that happened before 67 is not negotiable, you can convince them later on that everything that Israel did between 1993 and until the final phase of the negotiation is also irreversible. For instance, Greater Jerusalem gradually was annexed to Israel. Now, Greater Jerusalem is an interesting amoeba. It kept growing and growing and growing. Now it encompasses one-third of the West Bank. So Oslo was not anymore negotiating the West Bank. It was negotiating the West Bank minus the Greater Jerusalem area. But that was not all. While the negotiations took place, what we call the settlements in certain two areas became urban spaces annexed organically to Israel. And suddenly, it took time for the Palestinian to hear the new language. There was the language of blocks. And if you don't know Hebrew, you learn today a new Hebrew word. Block in Hebrew is block in English. So I'm also giving you for free uh, a lesson in the language. But it's an important word, blocks. These blocks are also amoebic. They kept growing. Blocks are those parts of the West Bank that there is an Israeli consensus, a Jewish-Israeli consensus, that they are also not part of the future negotiation. So the poor West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which were anyway only 22% of Palestine, shrunk while the negotiations were going on into 15%, than 10% of historical Palestine. So eventually, when the Israelis came to the negotiating table in 2000, and later on through American prospects, they repackaged the deal that was born in 1967, the deal was even not the whole of the West Bank as a return. It's true that there was an idea that the Palestinians would be very happy as people who like to collect sands, that they would get some of the sandy uh, lands uh, around uh, uh, the, the southern part of the West Bank in return for these blocks. So you get a block of sand for losing a block of fertile and very important land in the West Bank. But I think that doesn't matter. Even, even that doesn't matter. What matters is that even with the kind of facts that were established on the ground, even the kind of facts that were established on the ground, the Israeli government, successive Israeli governments, were still unhappy with any Palestinian position that did not accept their perception of what the Palestinian would get in return for the willingness to forget about the past, to forget about half of the Palestinian people, and to forget about 78% of Palestine. In return for that, the Palestinians thought that they will get a sovereign state. But they haven't read the Israeli political science textbooks. When it comes to the Palestinians, a state means something else. And the Israelis didn't look very far. They looked at Bantustan in South Africa, and they thought this is the kind of state the Palestinians should have. It made everybody happy in South Africa. Why shouldn't it make everybody happy in Israel and Palestine? So here we have a package that somehow the world is surprised that the Palestinians rejected, or some Palestinians rejected, and somehow the world is surprised did not materialize as a peace process. Now, in September, whatever the United Nations is going to decide, if the Security Council is going to accept Palestine as a state, it will be a full member state. If only the General Assembly is going to accept Palestine, it would be only an observatory member state uh, of the United Nations. Whatever is going to happen, 
you, won't, you are going to have a very bizarre historical situation. You will have the whole Western world supporting the idea of a two-state solution, an independent Palestine. You will have most of the United Nations members, and maybe the organization itself, supporting the idea. You will have Israeli politicians from left to right who say that they support the idea of a two-state solution. Probably all around the world people would say, this is it. The world is supporting it, the region is supporting it, and most of the Israeli Jews support it. And yet, on the ground, we were never further from any statehood as we are in 2011. The way the Israeli control, or the metrics of Israeli control, in the West Bank, and the way that the Gaza Strip is treated as a ghetto, means that never would a declaration of a state sound as hollow and insignificant and totally irrelevant as the September declaration of a Palestinian state. It's just amazing. I, I was looking at history books to see if there was something in, in the modern history, at least, that I could bring as an equivalent to explain the kind of absurd, the theater of absurd that we are invited to watch, both in the United Nations and on the ground. That means, for me as an historian, that if a representation of a reality, if a discourse about a reality, a conversation about a reality, has nothing to do with the reality on the ground, it is the reality that wins over, not the conversation. And we will have to change the conversation. The conversation on Israel and Palestine would have to change. The way Israelis and Jews live together in the whole of what used to be historic in Palestine, between the Mediterranean and the River Jordan, means that we have to reformulate the relationship between Arabs and Jews in that state on an equal basis, with equal rights, equal human rights, and equal civil rights. Something the two-state solution never granted them. It means that the complex system of legal regimes and military regimes that Israel imposed on different Palestinian groups, from those who live inside Israel to those who live in Gaza, that the various Israeli practices, policies, which stem from, a, to my mind, from very racist ideology, all these regimes, legal regimes, would have to be dismantled whether it's a two-state solution, a three-state solution, or a one-state solution. And finally, and this will be very difficult for the Israelis, but they will have to change the ideological infrastructure of the Jewish state. You cannot have in 2011, in the midst of the Arab world, a state that is based on a racist ideology. This is not going to work. A non-racist state for all its citizens, including those who were expelled in 1948 and should have an unconditional right to return, is something that has to be seriously discussed as a future solution. Now, I know that this sounds utopia to many people, and other people would say this is not feasible, this is not possible. And I'm not sure myself whether this journey for an alternative solution will work. But I do know something for certain, that the dominant hegemonic paradigm of a solution, the paradigm of parity, of partition, of two-state, is not working and actually is leading us to a catastrophe. And therefore, we have to abandon it. It doesn't mean that we know exactly how to substitute it. It only means that we have to legalize and legitimize a debate and a discussion of an alternative. And I will end by pointing out to three developments in, recent year, in the recent year that I think opened the way for the first time in the history uh, of the Zionist presence in Palestine, which started in the late 19th century, and the colonization of the state, that opens the way for a genuine dialogue between the colonizers of Palestine and those who were colonized, between the occupiers and the occupied, between the ethnic cleansers and those who were ethnically cleansed. And this is the dictionary we should use, by the way, 
uh, when we bury the two-state solution, we should bury also, the, as we do in Native American rights and other ancient rights, we should bury with the two-state solution also the old dictionaries of uh, uh, the paradigm of parity and all that goes on with it. And the three processes in the last year which I think opened the way for a genuine dialogue are the following. One is the Arab Spring, for a better word. Not that I will attempt here, and nobody should attempt, to predict exactly how it's going to evolve. Not that I have any better idea than you do whether it's going to fully succeed or not. Nobody knows, and probably in some countries it will develop better than others. But one thing is very clear uh, uh, from recent events in the Arab world, and this is that democracy for the people of Syria, of Lebanon, of Jordan, of Egypt, far away Arab countries such as Tunisia and Morocco. Democracy, I'm finishing with this report. Democracy means, democracy means the, a change of policy towards Israel. Corruption means continuing to be complacent and indifferent towards the plight of the Palestinians. So the Israelis, whether they like it or not, are going to face an Arab world that the more democratic it becomes, the more it would demand Israel to make genuine changes if it wants to be accepted in the neighborhood into which it uh, uh, came uninvited in the late 19th century. The second, and I'll do it quickly, is the mass movement of protest in Israel. This is an interesting mass movement because uh, in order to keep the movement as massive as possible, the occupation is not mentioned. The Palestinians are not mentioned. That's the only way you can get a mass movement in Israel, by, by sort of saying that you don't uh, uh, mention anything that goes on in the West Bank or the Gaza Strip and so on. However, this mass movement of protest has shown a distrust in the political elite, in the media, in the narratives that have been concocted and been constructed by the powers that be. And this healthy skepticism may lead the Israelis also to be doubtful about what they have been told about security, existence, the Arab-Israeli conflict, and Palestine. And finally, the Palestinians have opted this year and even before that year to lead, to allow the civil society to push forward the struggle, a popular struggle, mainly a non-violent struggle through the campaign of the boycott and divestment and sanctions, through the civil, civil disobedience that we are seeing more and more inside Israel and in the occupied territories. The non-violent mass, massive movement of the Palestinians is going to bring the conflict between Israel and Palestine to its basic departure point. It is not about land and it's not about geography. It's about human rights and civil rights. And when you have an armed struggle, when you have bombs, when you have all kinds of other things associated, you sometimes forget it. But this September, what is important is not the United Nations. What is important is that both the Arab world, the progressive Jewish communities around the world, the Western society, and the, people of, the progressive people of Israel and Palestine are saying the issue in Palestine was and is human rights and civil rights, which are systematically being violated by Israel since its foundation. And the only way forward for peace and reconciliation is to find a solution that allows people to live as equal uh, between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean. Thank you. Since I teach courses that often don't display the better angels of humanity about genocide, the Holocaust, the Arab-Israeli conflict, I have a habit of beginning my class discussions with a stab at humor, which almost always, in an uncanny way, involves gallows humor. But I won't do gallows humor now. I, I would like to start, though, with an attempt at comic relief that I think is a good segue into the comparison and contrast that Alan and I have as we look through nearly opposite ends of the telescope, as we try and make sense of a conflict both of us 
deeply care about and trying to influence to improve the lives of people. This involves an unlikely Yeshiva University attempt to form a rowing team. Turns out that Yeshiva University is not very athletically inclined and they're on the Hudson working day and night and it turns out an intramural competition between themselves, they still finish dead last. <laughs> so the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of Yeshiva University, finally decides to deploy Yankel. Yankel's a very observant Jew in both meanings of the word. He both is religious, orthodox, and he also has great insights and he has better than 2020 vision. So he's situated himself on the bull rushes of the Child River. And he is <laughs> going to be watching like a hawk, what Harvard does to be able to every year, every decade, finish first or second or third nationally. Trophies enviously sit on the walls. And so Yankel does, after schlepping down to Harvard, after six days, less than God took, he calls up the Rosh Yeshiva and says, I've got it. I understand what the trick is. Waiting with bated breath, Everyone waits for Yankel to return. He enters, and they say, so what is it? Tell us, Yankel, what is the trick? And he said, we should have eight guys rowing and only one guy shouting. <laughs> <laughs> so you will hear tonight more than one guy but neither of us will be shouting. We've had some exposure. By now, I think we could pretty closely sit in front of the mic and play each other's disc back for you. We know pretty much what our differences are, quite profound, but they will be civil. Uh, I start with, I suppose, a few observations before I focus on some of the historical questions that Ilan has raised for us tonight with Observations I make, as also a historian and an academic scholar, embedding myself as I understand it, not emotionally, not from my gut, but from my head as a scholar, but I'm also an activist. I've been very, very involved in not only track to diplomacy, but working with the Palestinian Authority, the PLO, the Israeli government, the White House, the State Department for years. And one could say, I am safely going to put not only my own children, but my grandchildren through college, because this conflict seems to have staying power. Uh, but I want to identify a few of these observations, both as a scholar, it's rooted on my understanding of history, but it also impacts the way I choose to identify goals and to try and work those goals so they have some positive impact. First observation. Both sides must give up hope for a better past. I want to repeat that. Both sides must give up all hope for a better past. We have a horrific past. We can't relive it. And we have very striking different narratives about the past, as you will hear. And you can find in scholarship, I can identify many people to support what I'm about to say, and Alan, I'm sure, can, besides citing his own work, come up with a few supporters at least, if not many more. So while history, in some sense, is not our enemy, but another very famous historian said that history weighs on us as a, a very toxic phenomena. And I want to establish the fact that what I look at in history, I know I can't change and the only thing I can do is learn some lessons, identify what I think the historical lessons are, and then forge a present that creates a better future. Often the past becomes a battleground that none of us get out of and we end up collapsing into a blame game. So I'd like just to keep in mind that we can't change the past, the present, and the future. Any solution must be consensual. Consensuality is the key to me, for me. There is no forced military or coercive way that you're going to get two peoples, Israelis and Palestinians, to allow some other deus ex machina to decide what it is 
they won't voluntarily agree to. You also, thirdly, are not likely to yield very good results if you begin a conflict mitigation episode in trying to get one side to plead a mea culpa that they are the voracious perpetrator and the other side is the innocent righteous victim. If you want one side to agree it is the sole problem and the other has contributed nothing to the problem and has no obligations to make compromises, you will not get a situation that is forward looking. Even in a situation where there is extreme imbalance of power that's obvious to anyone that looks at it. As hard as it sounds, the Palestinians, as the weak party, stateless and oppressed for many years, and in many diaspora situations, longing for restitution, they will have to make compromises. The long list of things that the Israelis, the Israelis, the Israelis, the Israelis have to do in his presentation is not to be dismissed. The Israelis have utterly painful compromises they will have to mistake, they will have to make with courageous leadership and a population that goes along. But to presume we have one slate of obligations and it's all Israel and the Palestinians have nothing to give except collect defies the basic premise of what happens in enhancing understanding to bring people together. I'd argue to you the Jews and the Jewish state of Israel was not born in original sin. And that is central to the presentation that we've heard. And I'm sure he can document the elements that lead him to conclude we have an example of Israeli ethnic cleansing. The problem is not 67, as he said. The problem is the attempt of Israel to expunge everything that happened before 67. Oy vey, does he have it wrong when it comes to Israel. The Israeli right wants to do the opposite. The Israeli right wants to talk about nothing but before 67, when Israel did not have the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem in its hands. They want to prove the Palestinian goal is the destruction of the state of Israel and not have a two-state solution. What Alan has just done is presented the right-wing Israeli view of the Palestinians and their goals. I don't know if anybody was listening. Now, he may be right. There may be many Palestinians, he could argue a majority, that will insist on reopening the 48 issue of the birth of Israel. There are a few factual problems that stand in the way of that as a historical analysis. One small, very problematic detail, for better or for worse, rightly or wrongly can argue, international legitimacy was conferred on the Jewish state of Israel by the United Nations Special Commission on Palestine in 1947. And lo and behold, the PLO in 1988, led by Yasser Arafat, the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people in 1988, established their first declaration of statehood. The first declaration of Palestinian statehood by the PLO was based on Resolution 181. And guess what 181 says? Not once, not twice, not 12 times, not a baker. It's 21 times it talks about partition of an Arab state and a Jewish state of Israel, a Jewish state. So we have international legitimacy confirmed on the state of Israel. Now, there's lots of problems with what happened in 47 and 48. I'm very clear and must listen, as all Israelis and American Jews do, to the story and the narrative of Palestinian Nakba in 47. The Israelis see this as their great moment of independence and the Palestinians with great understanding that we must have for them, they experience a great dispersal and a tragedy that becomes central. They still have the keys to their houses. They know exactly where their villages are. They can smell the air and for sure they talk to the next generation about returning to their home and returning to the villages. But an interesting thing along the way happens. The majority of Palestinians today, and I looked at now a compendium of public opinion polls as of this past week, over the last five years by the most reputable Palestinian think tanks, and it turns out that 25% of the Palestinians 
One that turned the clock back to right of return that leads to a single Palestinian state. 70% plus, and the lowest you get in this number, and this has been declining, the number of Palestinians that support a two-state solution has declined to about 63% today. Curiously enough, the one-state person, the bi-national state that Alain will talk more about, I'm sure, stays at about 25 and never gets above 30%. So the Palestinian public itself is overwhelmingly still, as crazy it may say seem, with mediocre at best results, Alain has identified the Jewish settlement expansion. Geometrically, I'll give you the numbers that he was kind enough to spare you. When Oslo began in 1993, that strikingly clear day in Washington, sitting in the front row, I saw this reluctant handshake between Arafat and Rabin, choreographed by William Jefferson Clinton. And at that moment, when this handshake took hold, I think it's fair to say people had romantic ideas. And certainly they didn't expect, the Palestinians for sure didn't, and I think most Israeli Jews didn't expect, that the agreement would allow the Israelis to actually, on the ground, double the size of Jewish settlements, the number of Jewish settlers, from 110,000 to nearly 220,000 by the time we got to the year 2000, and the attempt at one great leap between Yasser Arafat and Ehud Barak, sponsored by the same William Jefferson Clinton. So it's absolutely accurate to understand there were terrible flaws in Oslo, and one of the worst flaws Israel has made in its 64 youthful history is to agree to the occupation and pursue it. This is certainly a potential prescription of suicide through annexation, debasing the Israeli Jewish public, spending billions of dollars on an enterprise that should be spent within the green line, if you will, for equity between Jews and Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel, to go to poor neighborhoods that people would need to deal with the inequities within the Israeli society. This was, a, I think, foolhardy and extremely costly venture that's redounded to the misery of everyone, including the Israeli public. So I have no doubt he's right about the enterprise of the settlements being a problem, and the Israelis face an SOS. It's either security or settlements. They can't have security through settlements. I focus on security because I believe the Jewish state of Israel will not lose its international legitimacy, even in the current moment of growing isolation, because there are reasons why the United Nations and the international community recognized a Jewish state of Israel in 1940. 47 at UNESCO, the United States Special Committee on Palestine, and then later, officially, in 1949. I think we'll talk much more about this in our question and answer period. I don't mean to close all the doors as an absolutist here, but I feel compelled to clarify a different historical set of reference points. And about the refugees, two strategic things are important that ought to be kept in mind as facts, small facts, that make it a much more complicated game. One fact is, and I think he's right about this, what was missing in Oslo and was one of the structural failures of Oslo was not only the Israelis were allowed to pursue Jewish settlement building, and so there was a lot of talk, 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 as Ilan said, and not a lot of implementation, implementation of a two-state solution. The Israelis seemed to be headed in a confiscatory policy through its settlement enterprise in the West Bank. And what happened in 2000, and two in 2003, as Elon said, there would be, Elon said, what was needed was an international and a regional Arab involvement in this. And we got it through the Arab League. And that Arab League initiative, first announced actually by Tom Friedman's leak, then the Saudis owned up to it, and then it became a big issue, still borne by one of the things we haven't heard a thing about that's tied to my obsession with the state of Israel's right to security. You had Hamas engaging in the Pesach massacre in March within Israel. And at that point, the Israelis decided the siege of suicide terrorism, of which this was the most ghastly example, led the Israelis to go into the territories they had gotten out of in the central cities of the West Bank. And we had the beginning 
of an intensification of the murder and mayhem between Israelis and Palestinians. And the Arab League initiative was lost, but now that we revisit the Arab initiative, I concur that having the Arabs there with the Palestinians is critical. And if you look what the Arab League says about refugees, a just solution, ending the refugee problem, guess what they say? They say that all countries that accept Palestinian refugees, all states, all countries, this does not exclude, it includes Israel, has the right to a veto. It must be consensual. This is the Arab League. So let's deal with some of the realities that speak to the difficulties of Israel, absolutely. But the Palestinians are not going to have to make any compromises. Believe me, any way you think about it, there are huge compromises that are required on both sides. And the Arab League has said this. I agree. We should have Arab partners at the table. The Arab world is now in convulsions. We don't know if we even have an Arab League in the long run. What we also, I believe, as a principle, need to keep in mind, and Alan is right about this also, this is a moment of urgency, and you began by getting us started today by understanding the present danger that we face. I suggest we have a need for both urgency and endurance. This will require urgency for a new initiative that isn't just talk. If the United Nations is about decla declarations only, then it will be as meaningless as much of what happened in the Oslo Accords, even though I don't buy that all of it was meaningless. There were structural flaws in it that I think did it in, but I think there was also the possibility it could have gone another way, and it didn't, and nothing will change until there is implementation, and the Israelis have implementing to do on the ground to be sure, like a settlement freeze that's real. With a demonstration, there will be withdrawal from settlements, not just talking about it acts on the ground. Now, it's true he also said that these settlements are a problem and then went one bridge too far by saying these were irreversible. Politicians never say never and historians may say ir irreversible. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because when you look at the pattern of where Jewish settlements are in the occupied territories, in Judea and Samaria, in the disputed territories, you find there is something there that lends with a possibility that if there is a government with courage, a prime minister engaged in spine and not spin, that you will have Jewish settlements, the majority of settlers living in close proximity to the Green Line. He dismissed the idea of a, of a swap between lands, or some Jewish settlements that are in close proximity to the Green Line could be included in Israel for territorial swaps and trade-offs. Palestinians at Camp David were willing to entertain and, in fact, identified a number of areas they were willing to swap. And the PLO and the Palestinian Authority was also revealed in the leaks that were revealed by the, the TV station. I presume a lot of people here pay attention because it, it speaks the language and knows the culture around Al Jazeera. The Al Jazeera leaks talked about, and when you read the Al Jazeera leaks, you discover, whoa, the Palestinians don't see this as something that's impossible, the idea of swaps. The Israelis and the Palestinians disagree on some specific settlement blocks, and he's right. We're not just talking about settlements, we're talking about settlements that expanded and morphed into large blocks. And that will require some very serious negotiating and painful compromises. Compromises by both sides, the weaker one and the stronger one. I want to identify a way forward. He had three different areas that he talked about that were guides, and he also ended with three different hopeful points of what needs to be done. I'd like to take my own shot at the three things that are forward, because I don't think we've come to the end of the two-state solution by any means. Just as Oslo, during its heyday, particularly 1993 to 1995, where everyone was talking about the inevitability of a two-state solution and peace. Today, everyone's talking about the impossibility of it. Neither is correct. It is contingent. It's contingent on the way people think and the way people act. The majority of Israeli Jews, the majority of Palestinians, by very large majority, still aspire to a two-state solution. But the aspiration is meaningless 
And he's right without implementation and demonstration on the ground of changes. And to really make this discussion hard and me to make a revelatory statement that compromises, I think, both of what us feel if we're thinking of certitudes here. Today, between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, I'd argue to you there are de facto, with some small exaggeration, four states that exist. The Jewish state of Israel and recognized international boundaries by the world's community. It will stay. It's not going away. Now, I don't believe ever. There's a palace. There's a, also, uh, if you exaggerate a little bit, there's the proto-emergent quasi-Jewish state of the settlers in Judea and Samaria. That at this stage has a tendency to march to a different drummer and isn't even so mindful, insignificant numbers, the hilltop youth and others, of the, I would say there probably are about 3,000 men and by way of a family unit, that makes it, we're probably talking about close to 20,000 people that are committed to the rabbis that are their God and to a higher authority. These are religious zealots, messianically oriented, and they are given a good deal of leeway to be perceived and to represent themselves as the lords of the land in the occupied territories. And an Israeli government is going to have to deal with this group and implement change on the ground, or there is simply lip service being paid. But this isn't, so we have to talk about an Israeli government that will be able to cope with the Jewish settlers in the West Bank. And we have two Palestinian states that all of you are much more familiar with, again, with some exaggeration. Of course, neither of them are states, but they are quasi-territories that have aspirations of two groups that, in my humble opinion, talk about reconciliation and reunification, but they're playing a blame game about why it will not happen and who's to blame. Hamas aspires to govern and control and is, likes to assume responsibility for Gaza and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. In the baseball season, as we approach the World Series, a very famous manager, Leo DeRocher, said, my shortstop really sucks. My catcher can't catch a ball. I'd rather play with two less men in the position, if possible, and it would be addition through subtraction. The name of the game for people who are interested in the two-state solution is how do you get the two states people have been talking about now, and they've only been talking about them in serious detail, I'd argue to you, since probably uh, 2000. So I wouldn't go back to 1970. I think we started to drill down with the details of refugees, of Yerushalayim El Quds, where the border should be, water questions. All of these issues, I think, have been of recent vintage for a decade, and they've closed the gap in wordsmithing. They've closed it almost nowhere on the ground except in one key area, an area of hope. I'd argue to you that what's happening in places like Janine, um, which I've spent now, I've had four trips to Janine in the last year alone, uh, and this is a place that I wouldn't have been allowed to go. I'd have to sneak in the trunk of a car because it was considered the suicide uh, capital of the West Bank where there were suicide belts and there was a lot of recruiting there. This is part of an attempt to, it's a two-year effort that was announced by Salam Fayyad, the Palestinian Prime Minister, to be prepared for declaring statehood and with the feasibility of being able to handle statehood by September of 2011. Last year at the United Nations, none other than the President of the United States, Barack Obama, said next year he looks forward to a sovereign, independent Palestinian state on the basis of the 67 borders. Well, there is one place where we're seeing institution of a state on the way. It's not a Bantu stand. It needs to be demonstrated even more that it's expanding. There are parts of the northern West Bank that have a contiguity flow that can be developed 60% of the West Bank is Area C, under the sole control of the civil administration, in short, the Israeli army, and Palestinians are not allowed to step toe, step their toes in 70% in of the 60% of the West Bank. The Palestinian Authority has been negotiating with the Americans to get the Israelis to allow them to take this successful experiment in re recruiting and training new Palestinian brigades, providing law and order for their own people, and yes, we can say it, 
corroborating with the Israeli government to prevent and punish Palestinian acts of violence and terrorism and law and order in their own society. Now, I'm not turning this into some messianic beginning, but there is a process of good governance, of fiscal transparency, and law and order and effective combating of violence and terrorism. The warlords are mostly gone in the West Bank in these areas, and the Israeli government needs to be challenged immediately as a part of a post-United Nations declaration, whatever it is, that the Israeli government is prepared in Area C to demonstrate on-the-ground implementation, make it a big third further redeployment, which was supposed to be guaranteed in the Oslo Accords, and demonstrate the will and the capacity of the Palestinians not to provide Bantu stand coverage for a new South Africanization of the West Bank, but a demonstration that when the Israelis get out of territories, there is someone there on the Palestine side that provides the beginning of statehood self-determination and is effective. Small things like the thousands of rockets fired at Israel from Lebanon and Gaza, however you interpret those two wars, represent to the Israeli Jewish public a fear that's not completely legitimate given the rhetoric and the covenants that Hamas and Hezbollah have and the words that come out of Iran about their job trying to finish the job Hitler couldn't. In slightly different language, that's the way the Israelis hear it and they see it with rockets falling. There is a security question for the state of Israel that's real and not contrived and it must be dealt with. And there is a way of now the Israeli government securely imagining turning over land to a Palestinian authority on the way to a state. And there is a big chunk of land there for the Americans and the United Nations to negotiate and I think positive pressure on the Israelis and the Palestinians to make a deal happen. There's good news if you're an American Jew, if you're a Palestinian, go to, not only to Janin, go to the northern Galilee, just to the north of where Janin is, and you'll see a Jewish mayor former general, and a Palestinian citizen of Israel who's the deputy mayor. And you'll see Jewish kids and Israeli kids in large numbers learning each other's language. And while the rest of Israel seems like it is in a crisis on how they handle the Palestinian citizens of Israel and move it towards fairness and equality, go to visit Janin and then take a hop skip to that place in Israel and you will see an experiment that's a triangular, powerful, compelling message. It's not, pos it's not impossible for the Jewish state of Israel to treat its Palestinian citizens with equity and dignity. And it's not impossible to imagine a Palestinian state emerging. Mark, you're running... Okay, last okay. comment. Someone that represents, for me, a very spiritual... Because for me, the politics of making peace well, is not just the traditional you, cartography. Oh of drawing maps sure. that separates the state of Palestine and the state of Israel. We need cartographers who will draw that line that Palestinians really will agree to. But more than that, we need the cartography of the human heart. This is a conflict between two peoples struggling over the same piece of land. And I'd like to have a conversation that tries to reveal the empathy and the pathos for both, both people, in spite of the fact that often we come into this room that there's solely a perpetrator and solely uh, someone who's a victim. I'd like to talk about our real fears and concerns, and there's a man, singularly, that illustrates this. And most of you probably by now have heard and seen him. And that's Dr. Ezeldin Abu Yash, a medical doctor who was the first medical doctor that I know of that treated the first casualties of the December 1987 Intifada where a young man collapsed into his arms in the Jabalia refugee camp. This medical doctor had several of his children vaporized in the second to the last day of the war in Gaza by an Israeli tank. He's been asked to appeal and to testify against the state of Israel for war crimes. He's refused to do it. He's refused to do it because he believes that there is on both sides a huge amount of contribution to the conflict and wants to bring people to people together. While Mark was speaking, I realized one big difference between us. And uh, this has nothing to do with commitment to peace or a genuine wish to see uh, reconciliation taking place. And this was Mark's 
and I'm sure it's accurate, description about the uh, will or unwillingness of Palestinian refugees to come back to Israel. And I will never, as an Israeli who lives there and still wants to live there and who has children there, I am not interested in how many Palestinians want to come back or not. This is not the perspective from which I am judging the feasibility of the right of return. I am judging the right of return as an Israeli race, racist position which says we will never have a secure Jewish state if we are not a majority. And the people who support two-state solutions say, thank God the Palestinians don't want to come back in great numbers. I'm not sure it's true, but let's say it's true. And therefore, we can give up the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and re remain a majority, and therefore we can still be a democracy. Because we cannot be a democracy, this is even the liberal Zionist point of view, we cannot be a democracy if we lose the majority. In fact, most Israeli Jews would say we cannot be a democracy if the Palestinians inside Israel would be even 30%. And I don't want to educate my children like that. They come from a home where they had equal numbers of Palestinians and Jews as friends. They come from a family which regards Jews and Arabs alike. So what, are, what is the message that they're going to take? That God forbid, or thank God, there are not that many Palestinians uh, as future citizens of Israel. So I think where we differ is that my concern is not just for a feasible solution. It's for the nature of the state that I would live in. I have much more in common with my friend Mahmoud Yazbak in Nazareth and my friends in Jenin, than from any Jew from Brooklyn. I would like to share my future with the people of Jenin and the people of Haifa. And, I, and, if the people, and if the people of Haifa, who used to live in Haifa, want to come back, if it's 10% of 100%, I want them to come back. Because my will to, uh, to bring them back is far more important to my mind from the numbers that want to come back or not to come back.